And hello, folks. Uh, I am Jim Freund. With us today is Martin Cahill. Uh, it is 7 p.m. on May 19th. I always like to slate these things because I do not know whether or not the people uh, watching are watching this live, watching this late. Hold on. Let me. There we are. People should be made aware of the fact that uh, we're live on Facebook and live on YouTube visually, but this is for broadcast on Monday, which I believe will be the 23rd. Yes. So let me uh, tell you as we begin martin cahill is a science fiction and fantasy writer living in new york city and works as the marketing and publicity manager for air one books that's e r e w o h n he's a 2022 ignite finalist for best short story a graduate of the clarion science fiction and fantasy writers workshop of 2014 and a member of the new york city based writing group Altered Fluid. You can find his fiction in Clark's World, Lightspeed Magazine, Nightmare Magazine, Shimmer Magazine, Fireside Magazine, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies, which, despite it's not having the word magazine in its title, is indeed just that. His short story, God Meet, one word, appeared in the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2019 anthology, and he was a part of the writing team for Realms Batman The Blind Cut. Martin also writes and has written book reviews and essays for Tor.com, Book Riot. Pardon me while I attend to engineering issues here. Uh, Strange Horizons and the Barnes and Noble Science Fiction and Fantasy blog. You can find him online and now on screen at at sign McFly, like you know, Back to the Future, M C F L Y K Hill C A H I L L ninety. What's the ninety for, Marty? Ninety, the year I was born, Jim. Uh. God, you I'm can't. sorry. I hate to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me on the show. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and Hour of the Wolf, both live streaming and for those listening on the radio. Yeah. And and I see that a few people are starting to trickle in, uh, okay. uh, although I don't know where. And it's, it's always a strange thing when we do this because the stream happens at a different time in one venue than another. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you ever uh, look at different streaming things on different devices in your home, you might find things on the same platform. Like right. both Facebook can be as much as 10 seconds apart from each other, which is really confusing. A little bit. My my fiance just texted me and said, nothing's happening on YouTube. And I said, give it a second. You'll see. So. Yeah. And YouTube is a weird one. I have checked YouTube a few times with these things. And it always comes out in the wash. But sometimes it's hard to find. Um, so I know she can't hear me. But uh, you have to check both. There's a link that says video and another link that says media and one of them are for live streams and one of them are for things that i've uploaded mm -hmm. and i have no idea how to integrate them or even how to properly set up the youtube channel but i know that the end result on youtube is generally a little bit better looking than it is on facebook i know not why yeah well i i just i just told her to give it a second and uh Luckily, this is being recorded, which is nice. So. Yeah, well, yeah, the, 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 this is all archived. And, and for her, she lives with me, so she gets she gets this every day. Oh, so, so. Just, so just talk loud. I'll just speak, yeah, I'll just, she's in the other room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's great to be here, Jim. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean, we've worked together in various 
capacities initially because you were a publicist with another company. I'm tr I'm trying to think of which it was. Is it I had a I had a brief publicity experience with uh, Nightshade way back in the day, and yeah. then I dipped out of book out of, out of like uh, a day job in in the book world for a little while, and then I came back with uh, Erwan books, and I've been with Erwan. Uh, it'll be three years in August. So, wow. yeah, it's been great. And, and given that Erwan is what four years old. Yes, very early days, but um, very, very happy with the way things have been going. And we've got a, a, a ton of new books coming out from July 19th until about November. There's about two or three books a month. So keep an eye out if you are in the market for any new books, uh, speculative uh, or otherwise. Yeah, no, name some of the books. Oh, boy. We've got... Um, Oh, oh, I'll have to go through. I'll have to run the gamut very quickly. We have a. You can go to uh, what is it? Erewhonbooks.com. So Erewhonbooks.com. E R E W H O N B O O K S dot com. Erewhonbooks.com. Um, some highlights very briefly. We, we have a few debut novels coming out. Um, one is a fantasy. One is a sci-fi. Uh, one is a sort of um, Jeff Vandermeer weird uh, American Southwest uh, tale. Um, we've got uh, an Australian reprint. We have a forthcoming other translation that I can't talk about yet, but which will be very cool when, when I can. Um, we've got a few YA titles. We've got some sequels. We've got some new stuff. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a Marty party. And if you're listening, hashtag Marty party. No, you don't have to do that. Okay. But. And it's also Liz Gorinsky party. Uh, well, uh, Liz is no longer with Erwan, actually. I had no idea. I'll tell you more about it, uh, but Liz is off on other projects, and uh, they're doing great from what I understand. So uh, Sarah Guan is heading up editorial now, okay. and uh, we're just we're just rocking and rolling. Oh, very cool. But very we, cool. we love Liz. Liz has done an amazing job kicking off Air One, and uh, we're just doing everything we can to uh, succeed in the mission that they set out with. So Yeah, and uh, she was a tour for... Uh, a very long time in, in various capacities. Oh, yeah. And and uh, left tour, I think, basically for Air One, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, yeah, no, Liz, they've had a, a, an incredible career, so looking forward to whatever they do next. Yeah, okay, very good. So uh, tell us a little about your, I mean, I read your bio, but that yeah. doesn't tell people the kind of spec fic that you write. Oh boy, Jim, I, I, you're starting with the, the hard questions I see instead of the reading. Um, so I'll the, get to the, the reading in a moment, but oh, you know, sure. I mean, is, is there a way that you would typify yourself to somebody who already knows what speculative fiction or science fiction and fantasy are? Sure, sure. Oh boy, this is a tough one. I which is funny because in my, my day job as a publicist, I'm built to talk about books and writing. Uh, I just don't practice for myself very often. I think if I had to describe any of my work to somebody, I would say you're going to, I'm, I'm interested in uh, dense yet accessible world building. I mm -hmm. love that in all, all fiction I read. So I want to take readers to someplace brand new uh, with very exciting things happening, and I want them to be able to enjoy themselves as fast as possible. Um, I'm interested in characters living uh, at a moment that will hinge on whether they're able to succeed at what they're doing or not. So uh, when, when, I, when I describe a story idea to somebody, I will normally end with, um, so, you know, X character is trying to do Y, and the story is about what happens if they can't do it or, or what happens if they succeed. So I, I, I'm, I'm interested in moments of decision and change. And um, I think uh, I sort of realized that uh, uh, I grew up Irish Catholic. So, you know, death was always sort of uh, the next door neighbor in some ways, you know, very normal to talk about. Um, but a lot of my stories have to do with death and i realized that 
maybe not always death. Maybe, maybe uh, as I've recently in the last couple of published pieces was um, death is just a, a change of a state of change. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in those change moments and those change points and moments of where a reader can feel empathy. And if empathy is for a, bumblebee person as we'll discover in this story today or if that empathy is for a personification of death or if that empathy is for you know uh uh yeah i'm trying to think oh my god what have i written uh you know a, a chef cooking for these horrific demigods if, if if a reader can come away with at least a moment of understanding in a horrific situation uh i will consider my job well done Okay, so exactly. so you would say that your work uh, tends to skew more towards the fantastic than the science fictional. I do write more fantasy than sci-fi, but I, ironically enough, the story I'll be reading tonight is science fiction, um, which uh, I don't always dabble in, but I, I wrote this story and it's one of those, um, I, I hate making it sound easy because it's not easy, but it, it literally just came to me and I, I wrote it over the course of you know, a couple of weeks and then ran through a round of re revisions and sent it off. Um, so, you know, it, I, I, I prompt which is so much the better. Yeah. Yeah. So by, by Neil Clark, which ain't a bad thing. No, this story, um, I'm sure every writer out there in speculative fiction who has been doing this for a while, I'm sure has racked up rejection upon rejection from Neil Clark, who's incredible and an amazing, amazing editor. Uh, it is just very hard to break into Clark's world. Um, as, then, as it is with any of uh, what are now the adamant press. Oh, yeah. Oh, works, yeah. I which mean, include you've gotten uh, Nightmare Magazine and Lightspeed, and you're in one of the best American science fiction races, also John Joseph Adams. I am. I am. Um, uh, now, who was the editor that year? Because he has a, he's the chief of that whole enterprise. Yes, but, then, but yes, different editor every year. Correct. The editor for that year was Carmen Maria Machado, and yeah. I'm I'm such a huge fan of of her and her work, and getting the chance to uh, I mean to have to know that she read my story and enjoyed it to, for this collection uh, is incredible. And um, it was utterly surreal that year. I had seen her at the Brooklyn Book Festival, and. Uh, you know, our circles were had only we'd only we'd only ever been in each other's orbit very briefly. But she, I think she she remembered who I was, and I, I remember coming up to her, and uh, she gave me this big hug, and she was like, "Hey, congratulations! It's it was great to pick your story, and that that's will live with me forever." It was a, it was a very uh, cool moment, and um, but yeah, for this for this story for Clark's World, uh, I've been trying for ten years, and this was story number twenty that finally got in so anybody who's out there listening whether you are a first-time writer or been doing this for longer than i have no you, you can do it yeah you you can do it and having to said that having said that one out of 20 times to the same place is possibly a very good percentile uh I, you know, I had a friend who uh, got a story in with Clark's World, and, and but she said it was story number thirty nine or forty or something. Yeah. So I'll take twenty. I'm not complaining. I promise you. Oh no, it's a good thing. Yeah. So, so may, maybe are you read? Do you want to do that now? Do you want to do the story now? I would love to read the story okay. now, Jim. And you're going to do the uh, um, whole of the story. We're not. I will. I think it's only. Yeah, it's you just about four thousand words. Yeah. You know why you don't need. To, to hold that up because, because you can put up a I, because I can do it better than you that's it then I'll let I'll let the the master do his job okay so I'm gonna go hide now and you're going to read for us thank you Jim thank you Martin okay everybody thank you for joining us thank you for joining me I'm gonna read you a story this is from issue 187 of Clark's world it has been a dream in waiting to get my name on that cover, which is pretty dang cool. And I'm going to read a story for you. It's called An Urge to Create Honey by Martin Cahill. You stand in the airlock, wondering when they're going to let you come back home. As you wait, 
the new delicate hairs on your body twitch. Thousands of silent cilia sipping at this new vacuum, processing data at a rate nearly 20 times faster than your meat brain. We can feel you trying to understand, trying to adjust. Your new vocal cords modulate internally, the infant drone song of frustration, of fear. Your hands, new and old, flex. Two of them clutch at your head, just shy of the eyelash fine antenna, which twitch in your distress. Your song of unhappiness is shifting from subvocal to oral. And even in the dead air, a hum is building. After all, we were grown to sing to each other between the stars. One day, you will too. But for now, you stand here, frustrated and sad, as the people behind the glass wait, growing nervous at your buzzing. You are so new to the hive, young one. Our memory is long. Sometimes we forget the now, that you are so new to being one of us, your connection to us fragile as spun sugar. If we'd had our way, you will be cradled still, connected by dandelion tendrils to the heart of home, growing, learning. We would not let you go so easily. Yet here you are, standing patient at the doors of your past, ready to do your duty when you should still be with us, nestled in the gold heat of the hive, learning to become us. But no, the need is dire, the humans, excuse us, the station wouldn't have hailed us if they didn't need us, need you. We didn't know what you would become when we rescued you all those months ago, when we fed you and clothed you and healed you as only we know how, by consuming you, transmuting you. We didn't know what the first human to enter our family would be like. In, the moments of, in moments of darker humor, some of us thought you would not survive our honey. But you did. Then we feared you would not thank us for saving your life. That it was not our right to collect you from the velvet dark and nurse you back to health. It would not be the first time a human had misunderstood us, deliberately so. And if you ran away in horror, at least you would do so with a beating heart. But you did thank us. With a newborn's unsteady buzz, you were gracious, kind. Even as your psyche only partially melted with our hive, you exuded gratitude, warm and glowing. Even as new appendages grew outward and your body changed from our honey, even in your deepest moments of despair, which we felt as much as we saw, you clung to curiosity's mast unwilling to drown in fear's roiling waves. Here, as you wait for the figures behind the glass to hold up their end of the deal, we taste your fear again. There are many kinds within you, of course, but the string that is plucked loudest is that you will not be able to go home again, that the crash room you grew up in will have been given away, that the books with your old name in them will not be waiting for you patient as only paper saints can be. That image of your 20-foot cell, your previous hive, sits in your mind solid as stone. How we wish we could encircle you in our million arms, hold your body thorax close and whisper from soul to soul, child, there is no going back. There's no home to return to, only the one that you make. But this is a truth that you know, even as you try to hide from it, a relic of your humanity, that your need for evasion will fade. All we can do is midwife you through it. A hiss slices the air. The massive metal door shunts open and you walk into the corridor relieved the song within you growing loud and vibrant. When it closes behind you, small cannons burst from the metallic walls, pivoting to face you. Of course, we sigh. Your humans, they don't know the difference in your songs like we do. They think you are dangerous, 
while dismissing how dangerous they are in turn. Even if they cannot hear overtures of peace in your song, they should at least see you've retained your humanoid shape despite the changes. If it was one of us in that death box, moments from erasure, the answer would be immediate and aggressive. As it has been through our generations of conflict, the war echo would begin, and our song would begin to vibrate with the millions and millions of us back in the hive, a show of force, sword heavy with meaning. Kill this one, and you will answer to all of us. But already, you show us the ways we can grow. All four of your hands raised, gesturing to the cameras with open palms. Your vocal cords do not naturally move in the ways of your former physicality, but with strain, you help them remember their old shape. Through the buzz of the fear rattle, you speak with words, physical words, that people of your once home can hold in their hands and hearts. Not danger, you speak voice thrumming like digital discharge. Here to help. Words, words, crude words, inefficient, dead little sounds that convey no depth, no truth. The humans behind the glass cannot understand the burst of pheromones from you, can't taste the complexity of your fear or your hope that now, today, a bridge can be built if only it isn't burned down first. We catch a whisper from behind the glass. God, it still sounds like him. Your four hands tremble, and we wish we could comfort you. But you asked to do this alone, and so we let you. There is a hum as the weapons within the death box lose power and go silent. Your eyes flick up, staring into the one-way glass, your new layers of lids opening and closing. Already you develop your nervous tics, your habits of worry. You adapt. We are so proud. And then the door opens and in floods education. You see... Though we've met humans on battlefields of star and stone, not a one of the hive has ever made it past these bulkheads alive. Neither drone, nor gatherer, nor knight has ever walked through on four legs with heart still beating. From the dying minds of our beloved children, we've only seen phantoms on the other side. Tasted the ghost flavors of the station air of our then enemies. It only added to our terror, our rage, that we could not understand them, couldn't know the contours and steel smells of their own hive when they have so ruthlessly sent their own metal drones into ours with, so not, with not so much as a greeting dance. But today is a new day for many reasons. And as you walk in, we drink deeply from your thousand points, finally learning the world of humanity. A hiss-hum tango of oxygenation through vents like veins. The sterile, fractal nothingness of vaporized trash and dirt particulates hushing through space as cleaning programs activate. Flashes of light from pedestals and screens, winking in a language all their own. And there, sweat sitting unscrubbed from starched uniforms, as deep a blue as Midori's cosmic heart. It twinkles through the air like song, their own pheromones recognizable as music, but so different from ours, so vulnerable. We hadn't expected them to be as afraid as we are, were, are, nor as hopeful. One of the uniformed people steps forward, night cast. You are a head taller than them, and they look unaccustomed to tilting their gaze up at you in particular. You sink to a knee and they adjust their gaze. There's a smile on their face, barely so. Your song has shifted and it is mournful and joyful seeing this night cast. An old friend, we realize, recognizing the key changing you. An old friend who you are so happy, 
so scared to see. They place a brown hand under your chin and tilt your head up. We look through your eyes, too old, four new, and we see them study you until finally recognition. It really is you, Jonah, they say, words soft as breath, making the hairs in your face swoon with movement. Jonah, a word as useless as a molted husk, as precious and tender as newborn carapace. A name, not a thing we've ever had use for, but your song deepens at the mention of who you were, what you were called. That it still has meaning to you is bittersweet in our hearts, but we will regard it as lovely because that is how you feel about it too. You nod your head, not daring to attempt the dead sound speech again. But in your mind, we hear the whisper of a name, a title for the night cast, Isla. So Isla, they will be to us. As you nod, they nod in turn, raising another hand to signal the soldier cast surrounding you both. There is a shift of gravity as the rifles trained on you lower, a relaxing of muscle. Is it wrong that we didn't even notice? So often these weapons were the last thing our beloved drone saw. May things be different this time. We see them study you as the thought enters your mind, a dream remembered from a sleep you haven't partaken in. Not yet. Such is the way of the hive. Memory is a currency we freely trade, not even knowing we have the coin until it is time to lend. The memory tickles neurons, stimulates muscles, and a twitch runs through you. A secretion builds on your wrist, bubbling like foam. One of the soldier casts with a face like a detritus moon gestures to you, face turned up in disgust. Christ, is that what I think it is? Many take a step back on instinct, but not Isla. They all watch in fascination as the fear glands of the others begin to pump. We have labored hard within the hive to understand this fear. The substance that they fear is as holy to us as to their deities, more so since it is real and tangible. They call it honey a remark of wary wonder made in the heat of first contact all of those generations ago. It is like that substance of earth past, yes, when produced, oxygenated air turns it a brilliant gold and it sits thickly where it lands before becoming part of the holy chosen. The closest approximation would be the human word alchemize. With our honey, we heal you we fix what is broken by turning it into us. At least that's what we always theorize would happen. You, beautiful you, are the exception to this hypothesis. You are not us, nor are you who you were. You are something new. No, what you make now at your wrist is opaque, more akin to webbing than honey. Some part of you knows what it will do, and you raise your three other arms, a universal gesture of, may I? Isla, solid as truth, raises a dark eyebrow with the gesture. You trying to get me to join your new club? You shake your head, move a delicate hand from your lips toward them, willing them to know your meaning. Communication. Finally, looking around, they nod. Stand down, men. Jonah, approach. I'm trusting you. Ah, but we can hear the individuality within that you. Your old friend summons the ghost of loyalty they had for you back when you were of their number. It is a kindness we did not expect, but we know it doesn't extend to us. The hive will have to learn the kindness of humanity as they will have to do the same for us. With a delicate pluck, you lift free the little spore and place it on the back of their neck. The pain is quick, the flash of a psychic needle as their mind finds a place next to your own. We understand little of privacy, so we hear all that is to come. 
Is this better, Isla? Your meat words are more elegant here within your mind. They are more than sounds here. They are the heat flash of worry, the blue star heaviness of fear, the worried erosion of confidence moment by moment, a remembered hand holding another hand. They touch the back of their neck, feeling the little spore sitting at the base of their skull. It will come away easily. And you both know it at the same time. They think at you, finding comfort in that which we find sorrowful. The voice in your mind is the same as when you were human. Jonah, this is also bizarre. Bruised violet petals of panic, quickly gathered up in a gale force wind of control, scattered and just as quickly back in order. You quirk your head to the side and you smile as best you can around your new mandibles. Is it? I regret I can't speak the way I could before. I know it makes communication hard, but this way I can do more than talk with you. I can show you. There is joy in your mind and we feel them ascent agreeing as you show them the world of the hive, its warrens and catacombs, its royal orrery and its library of minds, its many souls all working in harmony. And while they see the new world you inhabit, even this is not true communication. They hear your voice. Yes, they see what you wish them to see. But Isla is not like you. They can't taste the shades of radiation painting the dark highways of space. They can't pluck memories from the millions strong of the hive. They can't even understand the five-part song of worry, tenacity, fear, joy, comfort. You are humming to yourself right now could only ever hear that top bass note and wonder. Ah, we have disappointed you. Strange this, that we cannot flood your mind with serotonin or bliss, can't extract you from sorrow as we can the others. That's okay. Your individuality is not something we would want to erase, even if it confuses us. Besides, if the plea is to be believed, there is a chance however slim, that true connection can be found here. Your mind turns toward the reason for the visit, and Isla catches the image of a young human strapped to a soft teal bed. Isla blinks, disoriented, unused to the psychic bleed. Right, they verbalize, for the benefit of the other soldier cast. You're here for the girl. Um, come on, I'll show you to her. You walk past the dead metal at the soldier's sides, flinching from the scar memories of other drones. Burning red weapon barrels form a wall of testimony in your mind, the last many saw here. Here, or at the Zeldrin frontier, or the burning border, or the static-filled song screaming, distorted by weeping under the indifferent light of a white dwarf star. The soldier casts stare at you even as the millions of the hive watch you with us. You don't bow under the weight of those innumerable eyes on you. You can't. There is work to be done. They're young. It's the first thing you notice, walking into the sanctified air of the medicinal comb, the air cool as mist on your fine hair. They are barely out of larval stage, it seems though we have always had difficulty knowing when your children stop being children. A palpitation, old scar tissue pulses with pain, a score from memory's knife. Cassie, long dark hair, missing teeth within a small jaw, a light of mischief and eyes hidden behind large glass frames. Cassie, this name, like Jonah, is precious to you. Maybe even more so. We hold it in our many hearts with reverence and care. It is always dear when your child has had a child, no matter the pain that comes next. She's been in a coma for a little over a month, Isla says, reading a chart at the foot of the bed. Found her in a distress pod, malnourished and unconscious. Oxygen was running low, too low. We fear brain damage, and we really don't know the extent of it. Medical has been hesitant to do anything beyond scans. They don't want to be the ones responsible for her flatlining. She was drifting in from the Grena colony, 
and we lost communication with them months ago. Who knows what she was running from? You go to a bed beside, you go to a knee beside her bed, putting a long, delicate hand on the larvas, your eyes searching their face. We know as well as you. The Grena system is many light cycles from here, and there are hungry things waiting in the dark between there and here. Why wait for me? Why ask for me, Isla? You don't take your eyes from the young one, but your voice is all iron in the mind of your friend. I've been with the Hive for six months. Initial friendly outreach from the Queens had been batted aside, dismissed as nonsense or mind games. Not a one of you could believe I was alive, let alone a part of the Hive you've been waging war on for generations. So why the change of heart? The silence between you is thick, congealing with all that's unsaid. Finally, they say, those reasons are classified, Jonah. If you want to know what Command was thinking, you'll have to rejoin the Union and our, end on our terms. <laughs> Bullshit. A flash of memory, the oceans of paperwork any human would have to swim through for even a simple answer. I've learned much in the Hive, Isla, and first among them, there is no secret between minds that paper can capture. If you can't speak freely here, you say, tapping your temple, then the Union truly has bought you, body and soul. A moment passes, too, lengthened by the speed of thought. You're ready to shunt them from your mind when they speak again, quiet and reverent, as though truth were a church and confession holy. I, I was tired of this station continually failing its children, no matter where they came from among the stars. And I saw in the message from the Queen's you had bothered to sign your actual signature with that little star curly cue. I always told you was unprofessional at best. And I, I thought if it was really you and the Queens were really interested in opening peace talks with an ambassador, access to their technology and medicine that together we could redeem this station even a little. Again, the face of Cassie. That loss echoes through you like an ancient bullet, shattering every delicate organ it touches with its horrible momentum. Thank you. You both share a memory of the young one of Cassie before turning back to the larva, the child on the table. We'll see what we can do. You stand then, turning all four arms over their prone body, whose mind has been sent away, it seems, for how long, we don't know. But we will. Our connection is different than with the other drones of the hive. Our mind does not unbend from the shape of individuality so easily. Your body grows and changes as ours has, retaining something of humanity, but your mind, at times we know you worry, you will never fully integrate into the hive. But when you focus and bear all your will, you can bring us to you. We can work through you. With focus as mighty as any starship engine, you open the mental floodgates and we join you. Our millions are alive in the delicate strands of your cilia, the fine points of your antenna, the filaments on the pads of your hands and chest, the facets of your eyes. We are you. You are us. Together we examine the larva youth. Fluctuations in body temperature and reoxygenation, the history of trauma living in their blood and bone, bruising internally, the healed wounds of the body. These are not the issue. No, your old friends, the doctors, have done what they can physically. It is as Isla intimated. This is an ailment of the mind. Our many minds push at the child's psyche, gentle as a scalpel in the hands of a surgeon. The reaction is almost immediate. They are in there still. We renew our search with vigor. The old term on our thousand tongues, cerebral hypoxia. We understand this. Some drones are born blue, unable to fly into the ether heights, destined for life on the lower combs, content until the day they return to the great gold. This little one was starved for oxygen, but not all at once. 
You read their chart as we probe deeper, hoping to find a solution. We dance light limber across their mind, seeing where to safest to lift their mind up and out of sleep. But as you read, we learn with you. The damage is too much, too extensive, some of us whisper. We cannot raise the dead. We cannot forego the price the great gold taxes us with, even we have limits. Somewhere amidst the mass of the hive, we feel you react. We see you comb the child's memory, those long, dark, cold days in the shuttle of the dead, clutching a crinkled photograph to their chest, breath fogging the icy glass shield, unable to see, alone in the dark, dying by a thousand breaths. It is a miracle they have even survived so long to make it here. We think as one, this is not a bad thing, to die surrounded by the warmth of the cone, of the comb, a night cast overseeing passage of the mind, which is when it fills you. As we reconcile with the truth, a burning sparks within your chest, just beneath the fresh carapace. It aches through you like a minor key. And in its sweet heat, you keen at the sorrow of it all. Yes, yes, you feel it now. That which we felt upon finding you, that which we always feel when presented with a cold, unfeeling universe, the burning desire to make it right, the evolutionary imperative to heal that which is broken. An urge to create honey fills you, and it doesn't matter how you are different. The hive shouts its pride and joy in unison as our new child understands us. It is enough to make the stars quake. Isla is not fast enough to stop you. Doesn't see what you're doing until your hand is already deep in your chest cavity, desperately reaching for the body for the answer your body is creating. Your fingers grab onto the vital thing and pull out a little white pearl, already turning gold as it's exposed to the air, turning thick, oozing, becoming honey. You place it on the tongue of the child before Isla can finish drawing the pistol. Jonah, are you fucking kidding me? They scream, slamming a button with their other hand. A wailing klaxon rises into the air and all doors open, the room flooding with soldier cast. You stand there patient and waiting, fearless in the face of so much death staring you down as rifle after rifle pins you there. Oh, we will learn this fearlessness from you, our beloved. What did you do to her? Isla demands, barking their meat words like you are dumb or like you cannot hear the frantic thump of their adrenalized heart. There is still enough humanity in you that you attempt to meet them where they're at. You speak back, the word leaking out of you. Healing. It doesn't take long. Our alchemy works fast. Races to repair neural tissue, coat vocal cords, convert proteins, and rebuild. Like the faint opening strings of an orchestra, we feel the stirring of a new mind enter the hive. Senses, cognition, awareness, each rising and falling as easy as breath, as beautiful and simple as math. Faint words flutter across our minds, tender as newborn wings. We taste a name, a life, a history. We, oh, Jonah, you turn, hearing them in your mind, clear as a bell and twice as bright. Their eyes flutter open though their mouth moves silently, grasping at words. But eventually they say, am I going to be okay? The room goes quiet. Then a mad scramble for a med chart, which pulses red with the activity of our alchemy, shouting that varies from, what in the world has happened to her cognitive functions, to, I'm reading dermal variations unlike anything we've seen. Is she becoming one of them? But that is a silly question. We're realizing all of us dawning on the same point at the same time. This child isn't becoming one of us. They're becoming like you. Will I become a bee person? They think at you as electrodes are placed on their temples. No cat. You think back because of course you know their name like you know the back of your hand. I felt the urge as they do to save a dying being by turning it into them. 
And while I had to be rebuilt like them in some ways after my accident, you didn't need that. You just needed to be healed in your own way. I did my best to help. Do you feel better? Oh, yeah, I do. They think while doctors shine lights in their eyes. Does that mean you and I are in a hive, in our own hive now or something? You can feel the thrum of their song within them, not as complex as yours, but already their vocal cords hum in a stranger way than they ever did. Their eyes drink in more richness and clarity from the world around them. You know, you respond, knowing they can feel the depth of your joy that you are not alone anymore. I get the feeling we could be. If you were okay with that, maybe there are some more people we could help who could join us. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, I, I'd like that. And the hunger in their voice is unmistakable. We all saw the crushing dark they passed through to get here. I've been alone for a while. I'd like to not be alone for a while. You nod and are escorted away. Isla already screaming at you for what you've done. But you can take some loud meat words. Not too high a price to pay for what's been accomplished. You did what they asked. It, you did what they asked you to do. You saved the child. And you did it by building a bridge. For how many more are out there in the vast dark in need of healing with no one to help? How many could use the help of a child of two worlds with an urge to heal through that honeyed touch? Those who know the value of a community and an individual mind who can utilize the best of both. We are weary of war, of willful misunderstandings, of mourning drones who hardly tasted stars on their wings. This room vibrates with fear, yes, but awe, its sibling, is present too. With you and this new child, maybe that bridge between worlds is possible. Maybe it can stand firm against those who would destroy it. Though you are only a hive of two for now, we hope that number will grow. And when it does, we will welcome them all, holding them thorax close. And remember that even this is holy, and that makes it alchemy. We are so proud of you, child. You have exceeded our every hope. You're everything a hive could want. Wow. Thank you for listening. Okay. Well, that was... That was a good read. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. I appreciate it. Like I said, uh, Jim and I were chatting yesterday. I said former theater kid and uh, improv comedian. So, so what do you mean by former theater kid? I never up you on that. Oh, I mean, I just did theater all through grade school, high school, college. I went out for some auditions. Uh, you know, when I first moved to the city, but I realized you can't uh, unless you're very, very talented. Auditioning for, for work and trying to have a writing career and having a day job, uh, even that was a bit too much for me to juggle. So, yeah. But I still I still get on stage from time to time. But yeah. Do you? Do you? Well, where, I, I had, what kind of I had, projects? Oh, I had a, I had a uh, D&D inspired improv show uh, a couple of years ago at the, uh, at the um, People's Improv Theater at the Pit, which was, which was lovely. So. The, I don't know the Pit. Where's the Oh, pit? yeah. Um, the pit is there's a few there's a few pits around people <laughs> Not going uh, well there's one there's one um oh goodness there's one in midtown and there's one sort of sort of lower east a little bit um mm -hmm. but uh but yeah i that was a i did that show for a couple of years and i always had a blast so cool Very yeah. Cool. yeah i mean sometimes when people say that they're theater kids they mean that their parents were in the theater it doesn't mean you, that even they oh were. oh no i was a kid doing theater and right. then i became an adult doing theater right. and i still you know we'll go catch a show when it's i mean obviously before the pandemic and whenever things are safe but uh but yeah oh, yeah, yeah I, uh, um for no particular reason because i don't read a lot of biographies much less showbiz biographies i've just been i've just started reading jennifer gray's biography oh, okay. of dirty dancing fame Ah, gotcha, but, gotcha, gotcha. But her father is Joel Gray. Hmm. 
I don't so know that that qualifies as a theater kid. And her mother, yeah, uh, did bus and truck companies all around, hmm. a lot of LA productions. And Very nice. Fact, and, and in fact, when she was born uh, in LA by C section about a month early, her mm -hmm. father was on stage in a Catskill resort, the same place hmm. where his father, Mickey Katz, the famous mm -hmm. uh, Catskill performer, had been huh. for years. So uh, well, that, right. you know. Yeah. I'd say that qualifies. It, yeah, yeah. So when I think theater kid, I go, oh, yeah, she's one. She's yep. not in theater. Both of her parents. Mm -hmm. That's a legacy right there. Yeah, it really is. It really it's is. Very nice. And, and going back to Mickey Katz, no less. It is, so it's uh, mm -hmm. not quite the Barrymores. But close two enough. Yeah, two generations less, but mm -hmm. cl close enough for theater, as it were. I mean, mm -hmm. we sometimes say close enough for radio, but all that. So where did that story come from? What hive mind, what fever dream brought oh, that on? Oh boy, that one, that one has been, that one's been years in the making. Um, I got this idea, I mean, it was just an idea ages ago, you know, the sort of hazy, half thought through uh, writer thing of like, you know, what if X and then Y? And, and the idea was sort of like, uh, you know, what if, you know, there was some individual, some guy who like, didn't get melded or like who like who tried to join a hive mind and it didn't quite take and mm -hmm. uh and, and i always thought that was interesting because you know what what happens you know if you're you know a hive mind you're literally never alone but here is a person who for whatever reason of course at the time i wasn't certain but like you know what would it be like to be somebody who was part of a hive mind knew that there were millions of other beings they were connected to, but but really couldn't take advantage of that, or really did, or really felt alone. You know, what what's loneliness like when you're part of a hive mind? And I was inspired to, and it's you know, it's always again like any writer will tell you like you know the thousand ideas in the back of your mind, um, just waiting for the right door to open. And uh, of all places, Lavar Burton had a short story contest last summer. Actually, and I read something about that. Yeah. Yeah, so so Lavar Burton reads his excellent podcast. Um, Lavar had a contest. He had teamed up with uh, the folks at Fire Magazine and Tor dot com, and he had said, "Hey, you know, I'm looking for some short stories to read. We want to celebrate the short story, um, which he does on his podcast." And he said, "You know, top three contestants will be read, and and uh, well, top one read on his podcast, top three published on Tor dot com, which is pretty cool." Um, and, it, and there was a theme around it of like, the theme was, um, I have to, it's, it's, I'll have to look it up for the exact quote. I think the theme was something like bridging worlds, bridging communities, um, you know, rituals and cultures, like you know, what's left behind as, as people, uh, you know, grow into a future, you know, uh, stuff, stuff, something of that nature of, you know, what's left behind or what changes. And I thought back to my, B person story and I was like oh yeah like you know I wonder what could be left behind you know what what could you know what and I, I just the more I thought about it I, you know little bits and pieces you know collecting it like uh like little threads that all start connecting together um I wasn't quite certain how it would work and then I started writing it and the minute I started writing it from the hives perspective I was like Oh, there's something unique. There's something interesting here, and and it really helped me. I was like, oh, this person's so alone. We're not even in their POV. We are in the POV of the hive mind who wishes he was able to be a larger part. And like, uh, yeah. And then it all just sort of tumbled from there. Yeah. Uh, how many bad or good jokes have you gotten from people about, you know? Oh, the, these are your B people. Who are your A people? Or, you know, what kind you of know, spinners have you gotten like that? Or <laughs> You know, that's the first, that's the first time I said that my, 
I'm the first dad, to see Fat Blow. My my dad is my dad has been partial to more more puns as is his want. Um, okay. But he uh, uh, um, but no one no one has done a direct A to B joke, which is kind of funny. Maybe, <laughs> given that it uh, uh, came from me, who knows? I will always I will always celebrate a dad joke, a pun, or a bad joke. Don't worry. Yes, there you go. I've been involved in comedy too long not to not to applaud them. Mm -hmm. um, let me just uh, mention to viewers, as opposed to listeners, if you're a listener, you're you're plumb out of luck because this is pre pre recorded. But if you are a viewer watching now, and we have a few, not not a ton, but a few. Uh, more people tend to watch this in archive than come in live. Um, type your question in, in the comments box or your comment in the questions. The, 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 you know, just type and I'll repeat what it is to type if it's something uh, relevant to Marty. Uh, <clears throat> just at what point... Did you start writing? I started writing when I was in eighth grade and our teacher at the time had asked us, we had just read uh, the adventures of Tom Sawyer in eighth grade and our teacher had said, Hey, you know, as a, you know, creative writing assignment, we're going to ask, you know, if you could write, uh, if you could rewrite the ending to, Tom Sawyer or like, like what would happen next sort of thing. Just like a, a little something to uh, teach us a bit about writing and to get us creatively involved. And I was always a huge reader. I was, you know, devouring books at that age um, back before a day job when I had plenty of time to read. And um, I think the assignment was for like three pages and I wrote, I think 16 or 18 pages. It was a <laughs> whole like suddenly a sudden murder mystery <laughs> came out of the adventures of Tom Sawyer. And uh, I remember, I, I, I just, uh, I remember writing, yeah, like 18 pages and handing it in. And she was like, Oh wow, this is so much. And I went, <laughs> is it good? And she's like, well, I need to read it first. And I said, okay. So, um, but I, I was very lucky to have those teachers encourage me. And it really was not too long after that, once I had sort of given myself permission to just dive in and try out and, and I was reading all sorts, you know, I was just on the cusp of discovering, you know, uh, all sorts of wonderful new writers that I was about to go to high school and I was reading all these comics. I just started, I just sort of recognized, I was like, I've got ideas and I want to, I, I should write them down and, you know, this would be a great job for me. I love writing. I love, you know, I love telling stories and I was always a, a ham and a class clown and you know it just made sense um so if uh you were a voracious reader in the eighth grade as was i what yeah. re what were you reading specifically who, or who yeah sure i mean at the time boy, boy, uh i was in my that was that was my like tolkien uh Tolkien phase, Brian Jacques phase. Uh, I was just about to discover Neil Gaiman. Um, who? Oh boy! Oh man! I, I uh, Shirley Jackson. I was beginning to read. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 at the time, what else? I was reading. I, I, I remember reading. I was the only person who read *Grapes of Wrath* and was like, "This is great! This, what a what a detailed journey." Um, Everyone else in my grade hated it, of course, because um, it's John Steinbeck. But like, you know, I was, yeah, what a oh man. I was definitely reading. I wonder if they watched the movie. Maybe they would have felt differently. Well, I don't think that was allowed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think. And then right. in high school. I mean, Henry Fonda, we're not talking. Well, dirty. I mean, movie, the, you know. no, 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 no. I, I just don't know. <laughs> for a small Catholic school if they would have done that. But uh, even the guy teaching it was like, this is a, this is a long book. And I was like, well, this is great. We got to yeah. find out what happens to that turtle. Um, yeah, right. But I, yeah, I think, and then in high school, everything just, you know, I was just grabbing everything I could and then so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I wish I could recall more off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, I was just a big, re I was reading a lot of comics 
you know, Ultimate Spider-Man and, you know, Brian Michael Bendis and Sandman and, you know, Why the Last Man, stuff that was way too old for me that I was just grabbing and reading. And I was like, oh, this is intense. Yeah, well, that, that, that's sort of how I read is I would always find a level or two above my mm. comprehension capability. And then I would uh, learn. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely, that definitely tracks. I remember um, in high school, like freshman year, I picked up American Gods and I was like, you can do this in fantasy books. Uh, and I, yeah, every, I, I, nothing, everything changed from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, afraid to ask what you thought of the TV version. I well, liked the first I only, season. I only watched the first season, so if I'm just judging off of what I've seen, I liked it. Yeah, yeah. It 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 uh, didn't quite stick to it after that because, of course, the original showrunner left. And right, Brian Fuller. Yeah, he's he's, oh, he's, he's great though. He, I mean, he is great, but apparently, um, I, who was it who I had on the show? Somebody worked. With uh, David Mack, uh, hmm. ha had a um, hissy fit about Brian Fuller because he has a habit of creating and uh, shows, great shows, mm -hmm. and seeing them through their first season, and then moving on to something else, hmm. and 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 they often drop and he did he's done that with star trek and he did that mm -hmm. with um wonderfalls and a number i remember, I remember wonderfalls yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, i'm really sorry they never brought his version of the monsters to series they did a pilot really i don't think i even i don't think i even know about that yeah, it was broadcast twice, each time on hmm. Halloween, and it's called 1313 Mockingbird Lane. Hmm. Okay, I'll and have to it, look it up. Uh, yeah, see, I, I think it's pretty rare, but it's hmm. well worth it because Grandpa really is a vampire. He's not oh. a comedy <laughs> vampire. He's a Right, he's a real, real-ass he, vampire. Yep, yep, he, he, yep. He's got hmm, teeth, okay, and he's not afraid to use them, especially when uh, there's sort of a bad guy in the episode and ends up becoming dinner. And gotcha. Uh, it it I th I thought it was wonderful. I thought, ooh, you know, here he is. Yeah. You know, now, what was the other show that he created? Uh, he did one season. It was brilliant, and then he dropped out, and it was awful. Carnival. Oh God! Oh my God! That's such a that's a throwback. I have not thought of that in forever. Yeah, yeah, and it never went to a third season, and th that often happens with his projects. But we shouldn't be evaluating all of this. Stuff. I'm not, and there's I'm not disparaging the guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a hardworking dude. Yeah, no, no. If I see his name, I I will go there. It's just that uh, heroes. There's another. Oh right! Oh my God! You're pulling I, out all the hits, Jim. No, yeah, but I'm just I'm just reciting what I remember of his CV, right, right, right. You know, and, and it shows what a golden touch he has. And then right. when he what happens when he leaves? Yeah, when he removes that touch, it all goes anti Midas, shall we say? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, anti Midas. So I, like I don't that. think it's been used before. But uh, I like that. Uh, he just uh, takes gold from everybody. Uh, no, he just removes his own. Mm, fair, fair, fair. Yeah. Fair enough. H have you ever thought of writing outside of prose, like comics or scripts or <clears throat> radio or... Oh, my God. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I... There, there, there's something about my brain where once I get a taste of something, I just want to go do more of it. And I always want to be challenging myself and I, I always want to be pushing myself as a writer and as, as a storyteller, which, which certainly involves collaboration. Um, you know, I, I was lucky to work on the, the um, Batman, the blind cut with Catherine Valente and K. Arsenal Rivera, um, 
which was adapted to a podcast slash radio show. And that was brilliant. Um, I'm a huge comic book guy. I'm a huge graphic novel guy. Um, and uh, I've certainly gotten ideas for screenplay. I've certainly gotten ideas for, for television, for comics. Um, right now, I'm actually building my own games, like tabletop role-playing games or journaling games. More and more people I talk to have been doing tabletop games. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know Claire Cooney and, and Carlos Fernandez, like they well, Carlos yeah. has been doing it for 20 years. Well that's true. That's true. I, I just know of their their new one which is coming out. Um, and and since they are now married, it would be it's a good way for them to spend time together. Yeah sure exactly. Claire, um, uh, um aka by the way if people want to look her up C S E Clue. C.S.E. Cooney, yes. yes. And uh, her, her debut novel, St. Death's Daughter, was incredible. So, yes. Uh, shout out. Um, but yeah, um, you know, so currently I'm, I'm learning the ins and outs and trying to build my own games. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to teach more and I'm trying to do more gaming, writing. And I don't know, I, I, just, I just am hungry to learn new things. I'm hungry to try my hand at things and... Um, to work with more people and to get to know people better. Um, you know, if anyone's listening and wants to give me a shot on Spider-Man, I will write a one panel, one page comic for you and we can go from there. But, uh, you know, I, I'm just, I, and, I mean. Why don't we repeat as we did at the top, <laughs> how people can reach you? Oh, sure. Well, if you, um, is this your way of saying we're wrapping up? Cause I'll, I will, yes. I want to say one let. Oh no! Well, I want to... time to do that, but I'm also letting oh, sure, people sure, know sure. That they should be getting out their pencil and paper so that they can write down at McFly Cahill ninety. You can find me. My address is my social security. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, uh, at McFly Cahill. Um, I was given the nickname McFly in college for obvious reasons. Uh, M C F L Y C A H I L L ninety. That's at McFly Cahill 90. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. Um, and I'm generally, I'm on the internet for my job. So you can always find me. And um, it's been, it's just been a pleasure. It's been really, it's been really fun to do this, Jim. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the story. I'm glad you enjoyed the read. I'm glad oh, my, so. my pipes have not uh, lost their touch, which is nice to know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I uh, I've not a... Kate Baker's reading yet. Have you? I started listening to it and I got goosebumps, so I want to dedicate some some real time to, to listening to how well she died. I mean, she's, she's incredible. Good. She's good. She's a very good reader, so I, yeah. I'm very excited to listen to her rendition. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to put a cap on it from before, like I'm hungry to try everything, and I want to make collaborate with as many people as possible. And I don't know, I just my ethos at the end of the day is. You put your head down, you keep your eyes on your own paper, you celebrate your friends and, your, and their wins, and you celebrate the wins of folks in your community, and you make friends, and you be kind, and you do good work. And, and hopefully, you know, if you can lift others up, they'll help you too, and that's sort of how I live my life. Sounds like a good uh, ethic. I'm trying. I'm trying. It's been a, it's been a busy year. Uh, and I, but I, I, a lot of, it's been a good year for a lot of folks. I know I've had a very good year so far as a, in, in my writing life, um, which I'm very grateful for. And, um, I just appreciate opportunities like this to get a chance to a, see you, Jim, cause it's good to see you. And, uh, to, nice Monday, hear, you, hear each other. Yes. And, and on the radio to hear each other. And, uh, I'm just looking forward to whatever comes next. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. And I think at this point, we will wrap up. Okay. Well, thank you all, everyone. Thank you for joining. If you're watching this archived, really appreciate you being here. Or listening um, to it archived. because, Or if you're listening to it archived, we also, uh, whatever medium. Org. <laughs> whatever, yes, exactly. Whatever medium you're listening to this, we appreciate you. Thank you for coming. And uh, I will leave it to Jim to say goodbye. Okay. Well, um, how about this? Goodbye. And, Goodbye, Jim. And thank you. That's, and that, that's Bye, everybody. Like the perfect thing. Oh, and we should mention to people if you actually want to read the text, this is from the April 2022 issue of Clark's World. Correct. And, and you can issue 187. 
Yes, and you can find that online, and you can even buy it online. So support support your support your short fiction magazines. Yes, very go. very much so. So uh, again, good evening, and uh, thanks again, Marty. Thank you, Jim. Whoop. Okay. Haven't gotten. Oh, I'm back on stream. Uh oh, I should stop looking at my phone. Hey, everybody, if you're joining us, we're here 